how you view release and how you talk about release. Um, you know, I would say the biggest thing that I talk about is that it happens over distance and time. So I would say the biggest distant connect that we have, and a lot of it's semantics, but it's also just how we interpret, how athletes interpret release. They think of it as the ski going from a high edge angle to completely to the other side. Um, and if you do that, it doesn't matter what discipline, it's gonna be too early or too late. Yeah, I'll go back to the comment I made earlier about that it happens over distance and time throughout the arc. So, you know, with, with edge release, if you do it all at once and go high edge angle to high edge angle, um, then um, depending, even in slalom, which you take this, the shortest arc possible, where that happens is critical to how it projects your center of mass. Um, and you take the opposite ends of the spectrum and go with downhill or super G. Um, and that's where definitely the progressive release oh, yeah. or the progressive change from the high edge angle, but it, 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 it has to lower, 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 lower. And obviously during this time you're moving forward and then you have a flat ski for a release. And then when you go to build, you don't just whack it up. You actually build the, the, the edge angle so that it matches the arc that you want to make. So whether it's a slalom turn or a downhill turn, that that release has to match the size of the arc. Situational skiing, situational moments. Yes. You know, you talk about that center of mass and maybe some people are just going to put their center of mass where they feel they need it yeah. and take their feet and put their feet where they feel they need yes. it. But what you're talking about is a basis of technique. Yes. Right? That Absolutely. foundation. It's just a foundation. And I think anytime you try to create absolutes in this sport, then it's going to be a problem. Everything's range of motion, right? So the ankle, ankle flexion is also a range of motion. So you, you definitely can go from the heel of the foot to the toe of the foot throughout the whole arc. And your angle or the ankle, um, even though in our plastic boot, you don't really see it move physically, but it is actually, you know, flexing and extending in that boot. Um, and I think that the problem that we run into is if everybody's trying to whack super hard forward all the time and just hold that, it's physically impossible with the forces. And so you have to allow for the range of motion. It's okay to, to, to get to the heel as long as you don't stay there. And, you know, it's the same thing, you know, if you're always gonna be hanging out in the front of the boot, um, that's actually just as bad as being back. So uh, range of motion is something that is really important and always something that you have to allow for because that's how you create movement. And, and speed. And speed, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. as soon as it, as soon as it stops, even if it's stopped in this perfect flexed, you know, forward position, it's not effective because you're, you're not going to continue moving forward. What drives your center of mass? And whatever's connected to the snow, it has to start there. Think about a kinetic chain. If my center of mass moves before my ankles drive it, I'm going to lose pressure on the ski. And so you have to go ankles, knees, hips. Yeah, you have to have that, this angle. Yep, it has to be the angle, but that that's how you drive the center of mass forward continually, is always starting movement from the ground up because that's that's what you're touching right there like i could take and throw everything around um but not not affect the ski other than it becomes cause and effect so. so how much does your psia training how much did that play with your success as a u.s ski team coach um i'd say it's it's a it's a basic foundation because that's um that's how I got into coaching was from PSIA. The, my first course setting clinics were actually with PSIA race camps. Um, and I had a lot of great mentors that had, you know, whether they'd been, they were coaching at the time and um, kind of do, doing dual roles. And so they would mentor and help um, uh, guide me towards, you know, different educational resources, books, everything, you know, because I would try to study anything I got to get my hands on.